you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn with me to Psalm chapter 117. Psalm 117. Um, I'll start with a story. Last summer, Carlin and I got to take a trip to Cozumel, Mexico, a Caribbean beach town. Um, and it's one of those trips that we went, just the two of us, my son, Cooper, went to with his grandparents, spent the week. And so the two of us went to get away, to relax, to unplug, to unwind. And, and we've been to this resort before. It's one of our favorite places to go. And when you go to a place over and over, you begin to recognize people and they kind of recognize you. And there was this guy that we had recognized and he had forgotten us, but we recognized him. And we started making small talk and he asked what we did, and I told him that I am a pastor. And so then he began to tell me how he had once preached and done all of this, and his life has taken a turn. And so that was on the first day we were there. The next day, we're laying out at the pool, sun shining, we're enjoying our day, and this man comes up to us, and he goes, Pastor, what is the Lord teaching you today? Now, if I went to you right now and asked you that question, I think many of you would get this flush feeling overtaking your body. You would get a little nervous and a little overwhelmed and a little worked up, and you would go, whoa, 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 and you would start maybe thinking about devotionals or sermons or just some verse you read, and you would just try to throw that out there to go, okay, at least I have something to answer. So, so he came up to me, and he didn't really care about my answer. He just wanted to quote some scripture to me, but I gave him an answer. I said, this is what God is teaching me. Day three, he walks up to us while we were at the pool. Pastor, what is the Lord teaching you today? Now you're going, okay, well, gosh, I used my answer, right? Like, and every single day that week, he came up to me and asked me, what is the Lord teaching you today? Luckily, on that trip, even though, you know, it's a vacation and sometimes we want to unwind from everything, even time with God, that trip has a really good rhythm to it for me that while Carlin gets ready, instead of just looking at my watch and going, how much longer? I just go sit outside, I read and I pray, and it works out well for everybody. And so I was able to answer him. But if you think about that question, it's not a question we get asked much, and we probably should ask it more. What is the Lord teaching you? I hadn't thought about that uh, question until this week. We were putting up Christmas, and Carlin has a letter board that she likes to adjust. During the Christmas season, I think it said, joy to the world, uh, the Lord has come. And so we were putting up Christmas tree and decorations, and she said, well, I need something new on my letter board. And so she said, Jordan, what is the Lord teaching you right now? And I said, the steadfast love of the Lord endures forever. And she said, okay, that sounds great. That'll fit. She said, what verse is that? And I said, I don't know what verse it is. It's in the Psalms. It's all over. She said, well, Jordan, find me a verse. I need a verse. <laughs> I said, well, the steadfast love of the Lord endures. That's what God is teaching me. That's what he is showing me. That's what he is revealing to me. So we went to Lamentations, and we found a verse that said exactly that, so it would fit nicely on the letter board, and everything would be nice and decorated well. But that's what I want to teach you today. That's what I think we need to hear. Friends, the steadfast love of the Lord, the constant and continual love of the Lord endures forever. So uh, verse, uh, Psalm 117 is where it stood out to me. As I've been studying the Psalms, this is the verse or the chapter where it really stood out. Chapter 117 of the Psalms is the shortest chapter in the Bible. It's only two verses, 28 words. This will probably be the shortest sermon of the year for me. So, that's all positives, right? Everybody's happy. But let's, uh, let's read it together, or I'll read it for us as we dive in. It says this, Praise the Lord, all nations. Extol Him, all peoples. Verse 2, For great is His steadfast love towards us, and the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord. All right, that's our text. So let's jump in. Verse 1, praise the Lord. What does that mean? Shout, proclaim, respond with hallelujahs to the Lord. The literal meaning of that word, praise the Lord, brings in this idea of light. It means shine a light upon it. 
bring it to light. Expose how great and how awesome the Lord is. Declare his goodness and greatness. Make him known. That's what this idea of praise is. Shine a light on it. Exalt it. Make it known. Make it seen. Make it visible to all people. And it says, all nations. This is the term in Hebrew, goy. Maybe you've heard that in movies or in something like that. But goy is just anybody that was not a Israelite, anybody that was not of the people of God. These are the other people. Praise uh, the Lord, all nations. That, that means it's not just the tribal identity of Israel, but all people all over the globe. Paul uses this verse in Romans chapter 15, verse 11, and he brings out this idea as well. He says, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles. Let all the peoples extol him. See, it's everybody is praising God. Now, we're going to get to that word extol, and I'm not going to be too proud to tell you that I didn't know what that word meant. I used some context clues and could guess, right? But I had to look it up. So I got a master's degree, but I still needed help. So I looked up extol, and I remember when I was reading this verse in my devotional time, I paused, I got my phone out, I typed this in, and this is what it said. To praise enthusiastically, to glorify, to laud, as the King James would say. I'm glad I was humble enough to just say, hey, I need to know exactly what that means. Praise him enthusiastically with energy and fervor. We don't have much energy today, all right? I don't have much energy. You don't have much energy. I feel it, all right? But, but this is what it's calling us to do, to praise him enthusiastically. Again, all peoples. The praise of God is not limited by the color, by the class, or by the country of origin of its people. The praise of God is by all nations, all tribes, and all tongues, that all can come and see, all can come and know, all can come and praise God most high. Verse 1 of Psalm 117 is a global invitation to everyone. Hey, all peoples, come and praise God. Verse 2. I told you it's a fast sermon today. For great is his steadfast love towards us. And the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. I shared with you that God is teaching me his steadfast love endures forever. But what is his steadfast love? The steadfast love of the Lord is the never-ending, never giving up, always and forever love of God. It's the unchanging, immovable, unfading love of God. It is the constant, continual, uninterrupted, unbroken love of God towards you. Now, I said a lot of things that maybe rhetorically sounded good, but I'm going to slow them down, and I want you to hear them. What is the steadfast love of God? It is the never-ending love of God towards you. What is, the, what is the steadfast love of God? It's never giving up on you, no matter what you've done. Well, what is that steadfast love? It's the always. It's the waffle house of love, right? It's always open. It, it's the unchanging. It doesn't waver with how you're doing. It's the immovable. It's not going anywhere. It's the unfading. It doesn't diminish doesn't retreat. What does this really mean? If you get nothing else, hear these next few words. You cannot stop God from loving you. You cannot stop God from loving you. You cannot stop him from loving you. Even when you run, he loves you. Even when you doubt, he loves you. Even when you fail, he loves you. Even when you struggle, he loves you. Do you remember the prodigal son story? Jesus is trying to give us a glimpse of his God and how much he loves us, his father. And, and he talks about the son who was on his way back. He had an apology that he was reciting in his head. He was prepared to go to his father with his apology and confess and be contrite. And do you remember what happens before an apology is ever given? He's hugged. 
He is embraced. Before he can confess, he is intimately embraced by the Father. Why? Because the Father never stopped loving the Son. You cannot make God stop loving you. Always and forever, never ending, never giving up kind of love. Do you know that God, friends? Is that who you pray to? Is that who you worship? I hope so. God's posture to you is always love. It doesn't mean that he condones all your activities or he allows your sin or he lowers his standard. No. But it simply means he's never going to stop loving you. Never, ever, always, and forever. The Bible's displayed that over and over again. Adam and Eve, they've done the forbidden. And God gifts them clothes and gives them a gracious promise. Abraham, he is tired and he's starting to doubt and starting to worry and he's tired of waiting. And what does God do? In his love, he gives him hope and a promise. You've got Joseph who's thrown in prison, who's abandoned by his family. He's he's struggling to continue to follow. And what does God do? In his love, he says, I've got a plan that's going to be greater than you can imagine. You've got the people who are slaves in Israel and they are in Egypt and they call out to their God. And what does he do? In his love, he sets them free. You've got the armies of Israel going against other armies that are bigger, stronger, better equipped than they are. And what does God do? In his love, he brings victory. You've got David who commits murder and adultery, and and he has run away from God, and yet, in God's love, he restores him and he forgives him. The steadfast love of God is on display throughout Scripture, and it's not just Old Testament, no. To Peter, who denied, there is love. To Paul, who persecuted, there is love. To Martha, who was overwhelmed and frustrated and just anxious about everything, there is love. His love shows up, his steadfast, constant, committed, never giving up love is there. The second phrase, great is his steadfast love and the faithfulness of the Lord never, or endures forever. Hebrews 10, 23 has been on my mind a lot. It says this at the end, he who promised is faithful. The God who promises these things to us, great things like salvation, small things like comfort and peace, He is faithful. He's trustworthy. He can be relied on. This season of this past season of Christmas, we did a lot of studying the Old Testament promises of God and seeing how Jesus fulfilled them how God fulfilled his promises in the person of Jesus that he sent, the anointed one. And it just reminded me every week as we were sitting in that, that he who promised is faithful, the one who promised David a a thousand years before Jesus, the one who promised Isaiah 700 years before Jesus, the one who told Micah that this was going to show up in Bethlehem, he who promised is faithful, and every promise was provided for. Friends, our God is faithful. He doesn't cheat He doesn't abandon us. He doesn't leave us. He doesn't allow his emotions to cloud his judgment. He doesn't get bitter. He doesn't hold grudges. God is faithful, constant, forever. His faithfulness, it says, will never end. We may look at this world and we see hopelessness all around us. We may be overwhelmed by all the pains and the problems that exist. We may be deceived into thinking that darkness is one. But we must remember that God has... God is faithful, and what he has promised, he will do. I learned something interesting. Psalm 117 is the middle chapter of the Bible. It's the shortest chapter, two verses, and it's the middle chapter of the Bible. Right here, in the dead center of the Bible, there is a message for all peoples, for all nations, That great is his steadfast love and that his faithfulness will never end. So if you are reading through your Bible and you are halfway there and you're maybe getting tired and you're a little worn out and you're going, where is this going? He says, I don't want you to forget. Great is his steadfast love and his faithfulness continues forever. 
God's constant and committed love is the story of Scripture. From Genesis 1 to Revelation 21, God's constant and committed love is the story of Scripture. It is God's message to you that I love you. I never stopped loving you. I will never stop loving you. I love you so much that I sent my son for you because you messed it up. I sent my son to you whom you hated. You mocked him, you beat him, you killed him. Why would I do this when I knew what would happen? Because I love you. I cannot stop loving you. I will never stop loving you. Because of my love, God is saying to us, I will do for you what you cannot do for yourself. Because of my love, I will do whatever it takes for you to be with me. Because of my love, I will endure it all. And here in this middle chapter of the Bible, in the most succinct message he could make, praise him, all peoples, extol him, all nations, for great is his steadfast love, and his faithfulness never ends. This last week, I've had the pastoral trifecta. I had a wedding, a sermon, and a funeral. It's a lot. A lot of extracurriculars there. On top of that, it was a holiday weekend, and we also are really sick in the house. I'm on antibiotic. Carlin's on a steroid. We're just making it by right now, to be completely honest. But I got to thinking about this verse. As I stood and I did a wedding for Cameron and Allison, the idea of the steadfast love of God as I was here getting to unite two people, two friends, and a covenant commitment to one another to steadfastly love each other no matter what comes their way, no matter what circumstance or calamity may present itself. And I share at every wedding I do that the, one of the best tastes of the love of God is found in the love of a spouse. It's not the only taste of the love of God, but it's a good taste of the love of God because it shows someone who is steadfast and faithful is how a marriage should be. The second event that I did that reminded me of this verse this week was the funeral of Mary Porter. The steadfast, constant, committed love of God. And I just, knowing Mary was just someone who was such a constant and committed to her God and to the church who was steadfast in her relationship and her desire for people to know God. And so I ask you this morning, when you consider that idea, for great is his steadfast love and his faithfulness endures forever. What does this mean for you? Some things it may mean is no matter how terrible the diagnosis, no matter how caught up in sin you are, no matter how deep in depression or addiction you may find yourself, no matter how overwhelmed or uncertain, no matter how exhausted or excited you are, the love of God does not change. In Romans chapter 8, Paul asked the question, what can separate us from the love of God? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword, will any of those things separate us? He goes on, verse 39. I mean, verse 37. No, in all of these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure of this, that neither death nor life, nor rulers or angels, nor things present or things to come, nor powers... Uh, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation. Nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So let's put a bow on this thing this morning. Your past, it doesn't disqualify you. Your present, it doesn't invalidate you. Your future, It doesn't undermine you. The constant love of God is always towards you. A love that cannot be really fully experienced here in this world. A love that is always and forever, constant and continual, steadfast and faithful. Great is his steadfast love. I want you to say that with me. Great is his steadfast love. 
Great, we're going to keep doing this a few times, all right? Great is his steadfast love. Great is his steadfast love. Great is his steadfast love. Do you know that? Do you? Do you trust that? Do you trust it? Do you believe it? Do you live like it's true? All of us could go teach this to the kids and say, oh, guys, I want to tell you, great is his steadfast love. And then we go home. Something doesn't go our way. Something doesn't go how we like it. We screw up somehow. We fall back into sin. And we start doubting the goodness and the grace of God, and we start doubting his steadfast love. It's immovable. It's always and forever. It's never giving up on you. Great is his steadfast love. Let me pray for us. God, I pray that you hammer that point home to us today. 